In this second session, instead of dealing with why Jesus told parables and with a, a fairly complex set of theological structures within the canon, I'm going to focus on just one parable. It's found in Matthew 25, 14 to 30. It's often called the parable of the talents. And I should warn the few of you who may have been here yesterday for the three sermons that I preached here yesterday, I should warn you that I'm going to overlap for about 10 minutes with some things I said yesterday as well. But for those of you who weren't here yesterday, you'll never know, will you? I'm reading from the 2011 NIV. It has two or three surprising renderings in it that may raise your eyebrows at first, uh, but I'll comment on them when we get to the text in more detail. Again, 2514, it, that is the kingdom of heaven. Again, the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So, you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. <clears throat> so grant, we beseech you, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. For Jesus' sake, amen. I wonder how many different kinds of waiting there are in the world. My son was born big and hungry. He is still big and hungry. When he was three or four, whenever we got close to a mealtime, he was mommy's little shadow, following her absolutely everywhere she went, especially if it was anywhere near the kitchen. But since my wife belonged to the old school, which didn't give endless little snacks before a meal, fearing it might spoil a child's appetite, though I'm not sure you could ever spoil his appetite, she didn't, she didn't 
provide any snacks before a meal. And so Nicholas remained hungry and followed her around. And, and she would say things like, Nicholas, it's only 10 minutes. It's only 10 minutes. But try to convey the notion of deferred gratification to a three or four year old. They have no idea what 10 minutes means. It just means I'm hungry. And what they want is something now. Meanwhile, at the same time, I might well have been in my study noting on my watch that lunch was just 10 minutes away and I was desperate to finish writing a paragraph that I'd been struggling over for some time and I finally had all the pieces in my head and knew what I was going to say and hoping for dear life that my favorite wife would not uh, call lunchtime um, too soon because if I had to start over again without having finished the paragraph, then it would take a lot longer to pick up all the pieces again and put them in decent array. Same 10 minutes. For me, those minutes were flashing by. For starving Nicholas, they were dragging on and on and on. Quite different kinds of waiting. There's the waiting for the sun to go down as you sit with your beloved, facing the west and watching the beauty and hoping it will never end. The waiting for the nausea of a round of chemotherapy to end. Waiting for a beloved one to die. Waiting for the worst of the grief to pass afterwards. Waiting for exam results. So many different kinds of waitings with such different associations connected with them. So the question that is asked in Matthew 24 and 25 is this. How do you wait for Jesus? In Matthew 24, 1 to 35, Jesus gives us a whole lot of instruction regarding his return. Now, those verses, as everyone knows, are very condensed. How you put them together is disputed. The main lines of thought can easily be discerned, but these are difficult verses. Nevertheless, we all recognize that they have to do with Jesus' return and the end of the age. But from 36 on, you're no longer dealing directly with the content of his return, but with instruction about how to wait for that return. So from halfway through chapter 24, all the way through to chapter 25, to the end of chapter 25, we're given instructions on how to wait for Jesus. So half a chapter given to the return of Christ, and a chapter and a half given to how to wait for the return of Christ once you understand that Christ is returning. And a lot of this material is in parabolic form, either parabolic in simple comparison or narrative parables. And it's worth following the thrust of this rather briefly before we come to our own. In each case, the next parable advances the argument a bit. It picks up something of what the previous parable or parables have said and then shows us another nuance, another element of what it means to wait for Jesus. So this is how you wait for Jesus. Number one, wait for the Lord Jesus as those who do not wish to be surprised by their master's return. Chapter 24, verses 36 to 44. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now notice the comparison between Noah's day and ours is not the degree of wickedness. The comparison is normalcy. It's not that Jesus is denying the degrees of wickedness in, I, in Noah's day. It's simply not his point here. The point is that in Noah's day, even despite the fact that no one was building the boat, Noah was building the boat, no one was, 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 was believing that he was wise or sensible. He was just an eccentric, an idiot. And even though he is called the preacher of righteousness in Hebrews, at the end of the day, he was completely unbelieved. So life continued with weddings and baby showers and picnics and summer holidays and funerals. Life went on. And that's what Jesus says it will be like just before he returns. There will be a degree of normalcy. 
Oh, there no doubt be wars and rumors of wars, but those happen all the time in any case too. But there will also be normal things like graduating and having a baby, and having a wedding, and birthday parties, and family celebrations. The point is that we are to be ready for the return of the Lord because there will not be the kinds of signs that will put a question mark over normalcy. Normalcy will still prevail. And then, lest we miss the point, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. In the nature of first century farming, these are likely to have been either father and son or two brothers. And one is taken, whether taken away, raptured, removed, or taken in judgment, it doesn't really make any difference. The point here is the division between them is absolute, all the way down to the family level. One's ready and one's not. But it's not just for the men. Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. In the nature of the case, these are likely to be two sisters or a mother-daughter. Instead of one of those great big mills pulled around by an ox, Instead, this is a hand mill with a base rock, another rock on top of with a hole in the middle into which you poured your seed, and a stick sticking out the side. The two women squat on other side of this mill, and one pulls the stick around 180 degrees, and the other one pulls it around the other 180 degrees, and the first one pulls it around 180 degrees. You keep pouring in seed, and you get your flour coming out the bottom. And one is taken, and the other is not. That's how sudden, how quick, how irreversible it will be. And the point is, therefore, be ready. Hence verse 42, therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Wait for the Lord Jesus as stewards, as those who do not wish to be surprised by the Master's return. And then there's even another analogy that is, that is uh, outlined for us to make the same point. Understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, Jesus is not comparing the ethics of the burglar with the ethics of the Son of Man. In an analogy, there are only certain points that are parallel. This, this turns out to be an important pre prepar preparatory point for our own parable. Note it well. This is not recommending burglary or presupposing that burglary is a good thing, but one of the things that happens in a burglary is, th is that it happens when you're unprepared for it. Um, I've only been burglarized once and I was unprepared. If I had been prepared, I guarantee you it would have turned out a very different way. And, and, and that is the very nature of being surprised by a burglary. So the suddenness of being burglarized when you're unprepared is likened to the suddenness of Jesus' return. It's, it's, it's unexpected. Therefore, you need to be prepared all the time. So that's the first way to wait. Wait for the Lord Jesus as those who do not wish to be surprised by the Master's return. Second, verses 45 to 51, wait for the Lord Jesus as stewards who must give an account of their service, faithful or otherwise. Wait for the Lord Jesus as stewards who must give an account of their service, faithful or otherwise. Verse 45, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Now, that is anticipating something of what goes on in the parable of the talents, too. Those who are faithful here are put in charge of more later. You find that many of these parables are linked. They anticipate forward or they begin to look backward. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But supposing that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. That's harking back to the previous one. You, you see? Each parable picks up previous lessons and then expounds them a little further. He will come at a time on a day when he does not expect him. At an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, wait for the Lord Jesus as stewards who must give an account of their service, faithful or otherwise. Undoubtedly, this suggests that there will be many ministers of the gospel, so-called, people who are widely accepted as stewards in charge of others, who nevertheless have been exploitative, manipulative, unfaithful, 
and who are rejected on the last day. They've mishandled the truth. Jesus can speak of some who, 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 who build poorly. Uh, the Apostle Paul can speak of some who build poorly in 1 Corinthians 3 as, as those who are saved but so as by fire. But all that they build is like wood, hay, stubble, just burned up in the last day, nothing to show for it. Some people build churches that way. They're not real conversions. There's not real spirit unction. It's all built on the power of personality and decent uh, corporate singing and smooth organization. But where the gospel actually takes hold, you're, you're building something that, that goes into eternity. But it is possible to build with really shoddy materials, or it's possible to become manipulative and cruel and exploitative, and God will hold people to account for that sort of thing. Those who seem to be stewards because they, in, they are in charge may turn out on the last day to be cast into outer darkness, we're told, where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. In other words, we're not just waiting. We're waiting even as we acknowledge that we will have to give an account of our service. That's how we, we are to wait. Wait for the Lord Jesus as stewards who must give an account of their service, faithful or otherwise. Number three, wait for the Lord Jesus as those who know the Master's coming may be long delayed. Wait for the Lord Jesus as those who know the Master's coming may be long delayed. 25, 1 to 13. This, of course, is the parable of the ten virgins. And to understand this parable, it is essential to know something of first century wedding practices. It was not uncommon in village life in the first century for a preliminary ceremony to take place in the bride's home, which would either be her older brother's home or her father's home or the like. And this would be for the families, the immediate kin, perhaps the closest friends. It would not be the official seminary. It was uh, uh, seminary. You can see that I've been corrupted by my past. Um, ceremony. It, it would not be the official ceremony, but it would be the, it would be the, the sort of preliminary. And, and then once this preliminary was over, there would be a procession through the streets, and those who were actually invited to the ceremony proper would join in in the streets and eventually get to the groom's place, and the groom's place was where the ceremony proper began. And if the groom were pretty poor, then uh, it wouldn't last more than a day. It, it, it would be outside the house and inside the house and that sort of thing. If, on the other hand, the groom were posh and had a little bit of money, then he might live in a gated community and uh, uh, his house might have a walled compound around it with a, with a gate, and, and the ceremony in this case might go on for an entire week. And, and it, it was the responsibility, not of the bride's parents to pay for things, as in most weddings today, but it was the responsibility instead for the gro of the groom, which was why most men didn't get married until they were a little older. They had to put together enough money to actually pull this off. So this was all done at the groom's place. But because nobody wore wristwatches, Nobody was locking their computer onto an atomic clock to make sure that they were right down to the last millisecond. Therefore, the time was more like what is sometimes referred to in the continent of Africa as African time. I have some friends who don't like the expression, but if you've lived there long enough, you understand what it means. And, and, and so you, you might expect the, the, the procession through the street to start at 7 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock at night after a nice meal or whatever. Uh, but, but, but in fact, it could go very much later, and nobody's going to be too surprised. So those who are supposed to join in in the procession, they're waiting along the route, and it gets dark. The sun's gone down. So they have their torches with them. And uh, their torches are fed by little, little bags of, of oil. And, and then they carry some extra oil and, and, and other little uh, uh, oil-proof pouches that they, that they use or little flasks to, to, to fill up the torch so that the, the torch can, can keep burning. And it's almost a badge of entry, do you see? They belong to the procession. They're waiting. They're not crashing the party. They're waiting as invited guests. But eventually the procession comes, and it's already midnight, much later than everybody thought. Meanwhile, these virgins, who have obviously been invited to the wedding party, have fallen asleep. There's nothing of mischief in that. There, there is no hint in the text that they, this was wicked on their part. What else do you expect them to do? This thing has gone on for a long time. Both the good virgins and the bad virgins both slept. That, that's, that's, not, that's not part of the symbolism. 
Moreover, those who try to make the oil to be symbolic of grace or the gift of the Holy Spirit or sufficient good works or the like, again, that's not the point either. There's, there's, there's no hint in the text of, uh, for, uh, for, for, to support such symbolism. Rather, the whole point turns on one detail. The wise ones have extra oil and anticipate the possibility of long delay. The foolish ones don't have extra oil, and the long delay catches them out. So you know what happens. The foolish ones have to trot off into town to get some more oil. All the shops are closed. It's midnight, for goodness sake. So they knock up some poor shopkeeper, waking him up, getting him out of bed, and finally bang on his door enough that he concedes, and he comes down, and he opens up a shop, and he pours them out some oil. And Then they go back to try to get in the line again, and they discover now that the entire party has got into the walled compound. The gates are shut, and they're left out. What's the point? Wait for the Lord Jesus as those who know the Master's coming may be long delayed. In other words, if you were dead certain, and rightly dead certain, that Christ were coming back in six months, you would act very differently than if you were pretty certain he wasn't coming back for another 200 years. Even if you're a devout and faithful Christian, you will act differently. If he's coming back in six months, then the aim is to get as many people converted as possible and people living faithfully as unto the Lord before he comes back, the judge of the living and the dead. If, on the other hand, he's not coming back for at least 200 years, then you're going to begin to think institutionally. How do you pass this on to the next generation? <laughs> do we need some Bible colleges or seminaries to help train people for the next generation of ministry? You begin to think institutionally, do you see? And so there are lots of strands of evidence in the New Testament that, that warn you that Christ's coming may be long delayed. A thousand years with the Lord is like a day in his sight. Peter reminds us in his first epistle. And so also here, wait for the Lord Jesus as those who know the Master's coming may be long delayed. We don't know when he's coming, but we don't know when he's not. So we have to be ready, but it may be long delayed. And then we come to our parable. And after our parable, there's one more that I'm not going to touch on now. I touched on it in one of the sessions yesterday, so if you want to find out more about the parable of the sheep and the goats, then uh, you can look at the series once it circulates. For our purposes, however, we come to what is often called the parable of the talents, verses 14 to 30. Let me tell you what the point is, and then we'll unpack it in some detail. Wait for the Lord Jesus as slaves commissioned to improve their master's assets. Wait for the Lord Jesus as slaves commissioned to improve their master's assets. Now, there are several detail, details in this parable that we need to understand to make sense of the parable. The first concerns the word talent. This has traditionally been called the parable of the talents because the Greek word used is talenton, and it just seemed the easiest way to render that as talent. But anyone who has checked knows that a talenton in Greek is a unit of weight, especially weight of measuring money. Some earlier NIVs have in the footnote worth more than $1,000. Uh, with all due respect, uh, that's called underestimation. A denarius was worth about one day's pay for a blue-collar worker. A talenton was the equivalent of 6,000 denarii. That is about 20 years of wages for a working man. Now, what that looks like depends on where you are in the country, but let's say 800,000 to a million dollars, something of that order, a lot of money. And that's if it's silver. If it's a talenton of gold, then it is worth a lot more than that. Millions and millions and millions. Each bag of gold is worth that amount of money. And that's why the NIV 2011 actually calls this the parable of the bags of gold. And that's the way you need to understand it in the context. That is, it's, it's a story about investing money and, and acting responsibly 
um, with respect to it. Now, its application in life covers more than money, but the story itself is of a talenton, not a talent. That's the first thing that needs to be understood. The second detail that needs to be understood is that these are slaves, not servants. Now, the reason why we need to understand that will become obvious in a few minutes. But you cannot make sense of this parable if you think that these people to whom the money has been assigned are union workers or personal servants. They are slaves or else the story makes no sense. But this no more justifies slavery than the earlier parable about burglars justifies burglary. There is an appeal, in other words, to a certain social convention at the time in order to draw an analogy. We'll see what that is in due course. But right through this parable, you must think slaves, or in due course, you'll get caught out and you won't be able to make sense of it. So now let's follow the line just a wee bit. The kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. In other words, the master himself makes an assessment of each slave's potential. And here it's worth reminding ourselves that slavery in the first century as an institution was a good deal more complex than the slavery in this country. In this country, all black men and women initially, and only black men and women initially, were slaves. There were no white slaves. And they had all become slaves initially by being captured on the west coast of Africa, either by whites or by other black tribes who captured them and sold them to the whites and then transported across the Atlantic. So slavery, in other words, was inevitably tied to blackness. It was ethnocentric. It was tied to a particular race. And it was all by capturing human beings and transporting them initially. But in the Roman world, it wasn't like that. In the Roman world, there were black slaves from Africa, and there were black free men from Africa, and there were black nobles from Africa. There were also Italian slaves and Italian free men and Italian nobles. There were English slaves and English nobles and English free men. There were Jewish slaves and Jewish free men and Jewish nobles. So although slavery was statistically far, far, far more common than it ever was in America, yet nevertheless, it was not ethnocentric the way it was in America. Moreover, slavery in the Roman world could be brought about for many different reasons. Often it was because of military skirmishes or the takeover of another parcel of land by the Roman legions and some of the people were captured and brought back as slaves. But sometimes it happened because there were no bankruptcy laws. There was no chapter 11, there was no chapter 13. So if you borrow a whole lot of money because the economy's looking pretty good and you're going to invest it and, and, and make some money, and then the economy goes belly up and you lose it all, you have no recourse but to sell yourself and perhaps your family as slaves. So as a result, thus, some slaves were brought about because of economic hard times rather than because of military captivity or, or, or a raiding party or something like that. That also meant that sometimes slaves were very gifted and educated people. Now, many weren't, of course. Many worked in the fields or did the potatoes or cleaned the latrines or whatever. Slaves, slavery is never nice, and inevitably, slaves are going to do most of the Joe jobs. It's, it's just the way it's going to be. But on the other hand, if you were a business person and really quite gifted and then lost the money, maybe even through no fault of your own, and became a slave to somebody, then you might actually become a slave who was your owner's business manager. And suddenly, you could have slaves who had more education, more financial acumen than the masters themselves. And thus, in this parable, the master is making an assessment of each slave's ability. What could they do? How would they handle a million bucks? Or if it's gold, how would they handle 20 million bucks in a bag of gold? Or 100 million, how would they handle that? Hmm? I'll make an assessment. And he distributes his wealth according to his assessment of their individual abilities. Do you see? That's the picture you must have in your mind. And they're slaves. Then we're told he went on a journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once. There's a certain alert commitment to get going on this assignment. 
and put his money to work and gained five bags more. Now, you must understand there was no NASDAQ, there was no FTSE index, there was no Dow, there was no stock market. All of those things are much later inventions. So when we are told he put the money to work, this means that he had to go and buy a farm or buy a fishing smack or buy a bakery or make one and gradually hire people and get a business going. In, in other words, this was not somebody sitting on the side investing in the right channels, but rather this is putting the money to work in, in investment, in building companies and structures. And if it's the kind of money we're thinking of, millions and millions and millions, it's, it's not easy to invest millions and millions and millions and millions in a whole lot, a lot of little companies. It's not as if you have 100 million and dump it all into Ford or GM or something like that. There, there are no businesses of that size in, in, in ancient Israel. This would be picking up a little company here and a farm over there and a dairy herd over here and, and, and so on, you, you see? And this would take a lot of hard work and overseeing the whole thing, but that's what he does. He sets out, and with this money, well, he puts it to work, and, and he gains five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now that's the setup for what happens next. After a long time, what is this phrase doing? It's harking back to the previous parable. It's reminding you that the master's return may be long delayed. Do you, do you see? We don't know. But in each case, each parable harks back and picks up one or more points from the previous parables. After a long delay, after a long time, the master of those servants returned, the master of those slaves returned, and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said. You entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. Do you, do you not detect a certain gentle pride in his success? He's worked hard. He's doubled the capital. And there's a certain pride in his success, slave or no. But the really astonishing thing is what the master says. There are two elements of what the master says that are utterly astonishing. They break all notions of slavery. Well done, good and faithful slave. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So, when you move outside the parabolic world, this is suggesting then that when Jesus returns, those who have been faithful with a few things here, over there are going to have much more work and much more responsibility. Indeed, the language is stunning. This is a talenton, at least of silver, maybe of gold. The, the, this man has been, has been entrusted with millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions, and now the master refers to it, you've been entrusted with a few scraps which suggests the unimaginable wealth of this master. And now I'm going to give you a real job. You've only had 100 million to work with. Now I'm going to give you a real job. Which ought to remind us that the images of what resurrection existence in the new heaven and the new earth will be like are very varied. We are not to reduce existence in the new heaven and the new earth to sitting on puffy clouds in white nightgowns strumming harps. Sometimes it's pictured as 10,000 times 10,000 around the throne in spectacular orchestral arrangements singing the praise of him who sits on the throne and the Lamb. Sometimes it's pictured as rest. Sometimes here it's pictured as work in which presumably you're growing and investing and training and building toward the future. I, I see no reason to think of, of the new heavens and the new earth as being static and flat. I wonder how much we'll grow in the first billion years or so. And, and then there are other pictures that, that anticipate the new heaven and, 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 the, and the new earth as, as belonging to a city with, with the, the water of... of the throne of God coming out, providing eternal life to all who drink from it with, with the trees of life on both sides of the river. And regularly we see that it's resurrection existence with a resurrection body like, like Christ's resurrection body. 
Do you see the images are right at the very edge of our periphery of understanding and, and envisioning? But don't forget this component of that vision. Hard work, but fun, responsibility, joy, pleasure. And if we take Revelation 21 and 22 seriously, no tiredness, no fatigue, no sin, no jealousy, no one-upmanship, people working hard and enjoying it. But the second element of what the master says to the slave is perhaps even more startling. He says, come and share your master's happiness. That's just not what masters say to slaves. Doesn't matter whether it's American slaves or Roman slaves or slaves in ancient China or anywhere else. There's not a major civilization in the world that hasn't had slaves until the 19th century. And in all of them, the master does not say to slaves, come and share your master's happiness. What he says is, I've just got home. Fix me my supper. Bring me my slippers. You can have your supper after you've served me. Isn't that what the slaves say? The slaves go and fetch. They do what they're supposed to do. They serve the master. The master's happiness is preeminent. Their job is to make the master happy. But not with this master. This master says, come and share your master's happiness. There, there's a different dynamic. For in truth, in the New Testament, Christians are regularly conceived of as slaves of Christ. In the New Testament, you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to Christ. You're either a slave to yourself or you're a slave to Christ. But the irony is that when you're a slave to Christ, you become truly a free person. If the Son shall make you free, then you are free indeed. But the same apostle who writes that insists that we are slaves, slaves to Christ. In fact, slavery to Christ is one of the most common images in the Pauline letters for genuine devotion to Christ, for faithful discipleship to Christ. And most of our English translations duck it and use servant instead, precisely because slavery has such bad associations in American history that we soften it and use the word, the, the word servant instead. I can understand why they do that. But the word is still slave. Every time you find doulos in your Greek New Testament, it means slave and nothing else. Never has meant anything else, never will mean anything else. It means slave. And in this parable, as we'll see in a moment, you can't change it to servant. It won't make sense. Just hang in there. So the second slave comes. He has been entrusted with a huge amount, but not quite as much as the first, according to the master's assessment of his ability. He comes and he says the same thing. The parable is structured somewhat artificially, on purpose. And what he does is double the amount as the first one doubled the amount, but it's a smaller amount, which shows that there's extra difficulty in doubling the amount when it's a huge amount. Do you, do you see? So we were right in seeing that part of the challenge was how do you invest profitably so much money as all of this? This man has a smaller amount, but still a fantastic amount of money for the first century. See. You entrusted me with two bags of gold. I have gained two more. He's double the amount. And his master replies to him with exactly the same words as he used in addressing the first, and still with the same two shocking themes. Well done, good and faithful slave. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master... He said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Now, if you think of this man as a servant who can resign his post if he wants to and take employment somewhere else, or a union laborer who has the right to withdraw his work. He has the right. Then what he says, in fact, has a certain kind of sense to it. You begin to have a certain kind of sympathy for him. The charge leveled by this man against the master is that the master is exploitative, grasping, and using the labor of others for his own advantage perhaps even putting the man in an invidious position. 
Supposing this man takes the million dollars, if it's silver, or maybe 15 or 20 million if it's gold, and, and, and invests it and proves to be successful. Who owns it when he's finished? The master. He gets nothing from it. He, he, he doesn't own any of it. Supposing instead he invests it and then the market goes belly up. You have two or three years of drought in an agricultural economy. What happens then? Well, then he's got nothing to show for it. He's lost the capital. And if he fails, in some sense, he's still held accountable. So he thinks to himself, I withdraw my labor. I withdraw my services. I'll just bury it in the ground. So we begin to feel a certain amount of sympathy for him. But what he overlooks is that in this story, he's not a union laborer or a servant. He's a slave. Again, this does not justify slavery as an institution, but it's the only thing that makes sense of the analogy. As a slave, he is supposed to do what he's told. He has been entrusted with his money and committed, commanded to actually invest it in a certain way. That is what he is supposed to do. And the slave master has the right actually to execute him if it turns out that he is unfaithful or runs away. Now, again, this is no more justifying slavery than the earlier parable justified burglary. But nevertheless, that's the analogy that is used. That is the relationship, the nature of the relationship between the master and the slave. And it turns out that this master is an astonishingly generous master. Look what he does with the first two. But this man is, in fact, wicked and lazy because he does not obey as he ought as a slave. He does not take any risks or any chance. He does not look after his master's assets. That's his job. His job is to improve his master's assets. That's what he is there for. That's what he exists for. So the master replies, you wicked, lazy slave. If your reasoning were right, he says to the slave, if your reasoning were right, and you know that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Doesn't it follow that at very least you should have put the money in the bank so that you could have at least gained interest if in fact you really are being motivated primarily by terror that I might come down too hard on you, then at least you should have gained some interest from this money. But the evidence of where this man's heart is is that he buries the money in the ground so that the master gets not one penny more, not one penny less, the slave calls this equitable, and in fact, it just covers up his own wickedness and laziness and disobedience as a slave. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. I can trust him with more. He knows what to do with things. He knows how to improve my assets. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. That is, has more in this business of multiplying my assets, has a track record of multiplying my assets. He'll be given more, entrusted with more. But whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless slave outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what's the point? Wait for the Lord Jesus as slaves commissioned to improve their master's assets. Now let's tease this out just a wee bit experientially before we conclude. How do we wait for Jesus? Our task while we wait is to improve the master's assets, not our own. I don't see how else you can take this parable. This is the role of a slave, and we're slaves of Christ. Our job, well, how much we will be entrusted with may vary quite a lot. Some people are entrusted with a kind of personality or education with a kind of gifts, of oratory, of unction, of living in a certain time and place where blessing abounds. And others instead are entrusted with 
the kind of perseverance that will make them martyrs for the cause of the truth? Or will serve as my dad did in a small corner in a small part of the world, unknown and largely uncared for by others, but each according to his ability, as the Lord assigns him his place and assigns him what he's got to invest, and the charge is to be faithful and improve the master's assets with what the Lord gives you. That's the charge. Your job as you wait for Jesus is to wait for Jesus as slaves committed to improving the master's assets. Second, presupposed in the parable then is that Jesus' followers, his slaves, joyfully recognize their roles and responsibilities. Their conduct is different from that of other slaves. If it is not different, they, they cannot be genuine slaves. They, they are going to be like the false steward who, who, who is exploitative, who, who, who does not take his responsibility in the second parable seriously and becomes exploitative and manipulative and so on. And they may turn out to be false slaves who are cast out on the last day. Or they may simply say, well, whatever's been given to me, it's, it's the Lord's. I'm not going to do anything with it for him. I'm just going to live my own life like the third slave here. No, no, no. Presupposed in the parable is that Jesus' true followers, his slaves, joyfully recognize their roles and may even exercise a certain kind of godly, quiet pride on the last day as they say to the master, see, this is what you gave me. This is what, in your grace, I brought forth. You gave me five bags of gold. I've got ten now. You gave me a Christian home and a Christian church. You know, I'm not the world's best evangelist, but there are these six people over here who are Christians because of my witness. I offer this to you. I've tried to improve your assets. Do you see? Third, the foolish virgins failed from thinking their part was too easy, so they made no provision. The wicked slave here fails for thinking his part is too hard, and he doesn't try. But above all, number four, our waiting for the Lord Jesus' return is never merely passive, just waiting for time to pass until he shows up. We have an obligation to improve Jesus' assets. Now, what this looks like will vary enormously from person to person. You move outside the parabolic world, and we're no longer talking about God giving us 20 million bucks or something like that to invest. He may give some of us some money to invest, and then the question does arrive, arise, all right, what do we do with the, with, with, with the money that God gives us? One remembers Charles Wesley's advice, earn as much as you can, give away as much as you can. But we can infer what some of this will look like just from Matthew's theology, let alone from the rest of the New Testament. For, for example, in chapter 10, we already have a trainee mission, preparing people to preach the gospel, extend the kingdom, and the book ends with a great commission to make disciples of all the nations. How do you improve the master's assets? You evangelize, you plant churches, you make disciples, you teach the truth, you teach the gospel. Do you, do you see? That's what you do to improve the master's assets. But also, it depends on a life that is transformed to reread the Sermon on the Mount. And, and there are norms for how you live under the kingdom. The kingdom brings with it the, 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 the structure and ethics of, of, of eternity already brought back into time so that we, we, we love our, our neighbors as ourselves. We even love those who hate us and despitefully use us. And, 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 and we, we, are, we are going to be like God himself who sends his reign upon the just and upon the unjust. So we will be even-handed with respect to those who like us and those who don't like us. We, we, we will even improve the Lord's assets by reflecting something of the Lord's character in our own lives. We will be laying up treasures in heaven. We will be anticipating the Master's well done, good and faithful slave on the last day, living in the light of eternity, hungering for his approval and blessing, not the approval and blessing of our ministerial peers. This parable does not tell us everything about how we improve the Master's assets. What it does do is set forth the fact 
that that is what God expects of us. And then out of that deep commitment, we will find ways to assess all that the Lord has put into our hands and trust it to us as we try to think through what it means to be a faithful slave of Jesus, improving his assets as we wait for his return. The ultimate goal is sharing in this master's happiness, gaining his approval, and thus actually receiving more responsibility in the presence of God in the consummated kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray.